Are the midterms tilting Republican again? Why are we still funding Peter Daszak and what to make of the Gavin Newsom trans sanctuary? We'll discuss all this and more on this edition of The Editors. I'm Rich Lowry. I'm joined as always by the right Honorable Charles C.W. Cook, the notorious MBD, Michael Brendan Doherty, and sorry, uh, wait a second, uh, Sarah? Yes. I thought we were getting Pino. Uh, he was busy this morning. I'm sorry. He couldn't make it. No Pino? No, sorry. It's Butler? Indeed. No Pino. He's just out? Just out. I, mm. I did the best I could. All right. Okay. All right. Three, two, one, and Jack Butler. You are, of course, listening to a National Review podcast. Our sponsors of this episode are Net Choice, Tommy John, and Masterworks. If for some reason you're not already following us on the streaming service, you can find us everywhere from Spotify to iTunes. If you like what you hear, please consider give, giving us a glowing five star review on iTunes. If you don't like what you hear here, please forget I said anything. And before we start in earnest, Let's hear a message from our first sponsor today, NetChoice, a trade organization dedicated to free expression and free enterprise online. Being a parent is never easy, especially during the technology age. With more kids going online at younger ages, parents want to keep their kids safe and secure on the internet. Protect their kids. Parents use services they trust, including the world-leading privacy and security measures which are currently offered by tech services like app stores. But a new bill in Congress called the Open App Markets Act would disable many of these services by forcing companies to share their privacy and security features with third parties. If passed, the nonprofit Stop Child Predators warns that the Open App Markets Act will risk child safety online by breaking down these digital guard walls that protect children. It shouldn't be harder for parents to keep their kids safe online. Tell your senator, say no to the Open App Markets Act. To learn more, please visit netchoice.org. So MBD, we got the midterms coming up here about five weeks. It looks as though things might be turning up a, a little bit for Republicans. Pennsylvania is getting narrower and Ron Johnson has in the last couple of polls up in Wisconsin a four or five point lead. I, I think that's that's basically unprecedented for Ron Johnson. Someone was telling me uh, he he didn't think that Ron Johnson had led in any public poll ever, even though he's he's won two Senate races up there. And the big issue is crime. Mandela Barnes is just getting whacked with this issue. He was a, a big fan of the squad. He favored uh, defunding the police or taking a portion of police funding and giving it to neighborhood services, which was supposed to be just as good at, at fighting and reducing crime and opposed cash bail. His campaign said earlier this year he wants to end cash bail nationally. It's been a debacle you know, in places like New York City. And then John Fetterman also getting hammered on this issue. Oz still trailing in every public poll that we've seen, but that race is tightening up and you have a lot of people squawking. This is this has been an ongoing debate on the last 30 or 40 years. Whenever Republicans highlight crime, Democrats say how racist of you. And they're saying that again. What do you make of it? Well, I mean, this was inevitable. I mean, I, I was talking about it with some friends uh, yesterday, actually, and they talked about how Glenn Lowry, the uh, professor formerly at, at Brown, who's now at the the new startup in Austin, uh, had kind of predicted this, that if uh, it was going to be a five alarm news every time uh, a white police officer had a bad interaction with a person of color um, in the process of making an arrest that um, naturally there's lots of video cameras everywhere now uh, in doorbells and uh, you know CCTV style surveillance of city streets etc uh, now we're seeing lots of videos of crime and going with our huge spike in violent crime which is something that is uh, feature of all local newscasts. Um, and um, some of these crimes are really, uh, truly horrifying. I mean, in in uh, Philadelphia, I think two weeks ago, I mean, there was a video of an unbelievable uh, execution style murder of um, a student, a college student, just walking up a street that is not considered especially dangerous. 
and just a stranger passed by him and turned around and fired into the back of his head. Uh, there's no relationship between the two people at all. This kind of thing uh, sets people off and it, it, it inspires uh, suburban women <laughs> to vote Republican. Uh, and that is, they have been one of the big movers in the last several elections as they were repulsed by Donald Trump and went more and more with Democrats. But, um, you know, the, the, the security mom type uh, typology uh, among political consultants is real for a reason. Um, this is exactly what we have governments to do, which is to restrain and punish the violent and criminal. Uh, it's an absolutely legitimate issue. Of course, Wisconsin is going to have this as a major issue because, you know, we witnessed riots in Kenosha and Democrats associated themselves with uh, posting bail for people mm -hmm. arrested in rioting. Uh, so, yeah, of course, Republicans have to make this an issue. And they have to remember that this is not a uh, racist issue um, because people of color don't like crime either. I mean, it's racist to assume that they mm -hmm. do or that they have some like much higher tolerance for it in their own communities. Um, you know, Yes, communities of color have more crime in them uh, for all sorts of reasons and people can speculate about. But because of that, they also want uh, law and order. They want cops on the beat uh, preventing crime from happening, not just showing up after it's too late, like little consultants or insurance agents. Yeah. So this is going to be a major, this is going to be a, a, a huge advantage for Republicans going forward. Yeah, eighty or ninety percent of murder victims in Philadelphia and Milwaukee are uh, non non white. And Jack, obviously, just teasing, delighted you you're here. Um, but with Mandela Barnes, you can't go and have an event with Ilan. Omar and then tweet how well wonderful she is and how she's fighting the righteous battle and expect that not to be used against you. And the idea that it's, it's racist because the, the squad, you know, all the members of the squad are non-white. Well, why, why is that, uh, you know, Ron Johnson's problem? Shouldn't the squad go out and, and recruit a more diverse membership? And then Fetterman's classic thing, first of all, all the same ads are being used against Fetterman, but you had all this media coverage for years now. Fetterman might be the most photographed uh, uh, Senate candidate in all of America. I think he probably is. And uh, it was all based on, wow, you know, he has a shaved head. He's really big. He has tattoos. This is a guy who connects with the working class. At the same time, he had these, you know, he has these extreme woke uh, attitudes and policies on crime, which are going to make him vulnerable and, and or perhaps repellent to the, the working class if Oz does his job. Yeah, I mean, about Fetterman specifically, the, the image that he's projected is basically a massive PR stunt. I mean, he's a Harvard alum trust fund baby, lived with his parents until relatively recently, if, I, if my facts are correct. But yes, as for the crime issue in both of these states and in other states, this is one of these things that voters respond to because it is a lived reality of just their existence. It, when, it, when crime goes up in a place that you live or a place that you're familiar with, it affects you. It makes you nervous uh, at, at, at best. And sometimes your, your people, people are directly affected by, you know, getting uh, mugged or, or what have you. I mean, there was the whole mugging by reality is what is what how we got uh, neoconservatives for example uh, people who are of the left who just saw the way that uh, liberal policies were creating social pathologies uh, or at the at best ignoring them or pretending that they could be solved by uh, you know government interventions of a of a more therapeutic variety so yes this is a real issue and it's one that We've just seen over the past couple of years that the left really has no good answer to. They, the, when, when quartered on this, people who are the exponents of the most uh, radical policies in this area, they obfuscate, they, they try to dodge. You had Larry Krasner, the Philadelphia district attorney, confronted with the, about this recently, said the, the real problem is that the crime is increasing and 
MAGA states. And okay, uh, I, I don't have the wherewithal at this very moment to do a breakdown here, but let's let's look at the. I mean, a state is a big place there, and you'd want to, I assume, look at the like, for example, the largest population centers in a state. But it's all increased in a country run by a Democrat. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that this is that that goes to. I mean, for many problems, crime crime among them, when you, you kind of what you look for is the most convenient available Republican to blame. This is a pattern you will see in in all in local issues a lot. But yeah, this is a real issue. And to the extent that Johnson and Oz, uh, of all people, have been able the latter that is have been able to make it one. I, I think that they're they're making Johnson is making his campaign more into the into the positive territory than he's used to. I mean, this is a guy who's defied polling twice, but now for once before an election, he's showing that he's ahead. And Oz is actually turning his race into a live one. I, I was pretty down and pessimistic about pessimistic about this race. I still am in the sense that I I believe that Pennsylvanians deserve a much better choice than the one that they're getting. But Oz seems to be winnowing away at, at the gap that was previously seemingly insurmountable. And I think that confronting Fetterman on the issue of crime and the disparity between his authentic, you know, fake blue collar persona and the actual reality of his policies and preferences on the kinds of people that he wants to help, that's been really helping him. Yeah. And I just think in general, the, the environment, the economy, it never went away as as an issue, um, but it's just it's just clear the weight it's going to have in November vis- vis-a-vis an issue like abortion. And with this ad barrage, it seem, seems Republicans have had some success in uh, elevating the issue of crime over abortion. So, Charlie, um, barring something unforeseen, um, for my money, one of the most gratifying results in November will be when Brian Kemp beats Stacey Abrams once again. She 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 has not had a, a good... Uh, a good 2022 here. She has had to kind of back off her claims that she the election was stolen from her in 2018. She said on The View and another podcast interview down in Georgia, well, I never said the election was stolen or questioned the legitimacy of the election because she she's embarrassed. At the same time, Democrats are, you know, rightly hitting Trump over his election denialism to have this denialist who's a Democratic heroine is kind of awkward. So she's backed off that. And then we had this decision from a federal district court judge on Friday, just excoriating 288 page decision on some of these key claims she made about why the 2018 election system in Georgia election rules constituted voter suppression. And this judge went through a couple of these. Not not all of them were involved in this case. A couple have fallen off because there were changes in the laws in, in Georgia that made a couple of these questions mute, moot. But a few really key things that she's talked about repeatedly that she writes about in her book about why the election was stolen. The judge looks and like, where is the evidence of one voter being negatively impacted by this? And we had an editorial uh, on this up yesterday, Monday, and th- there is one of the points of contention is the system for if you request an absentee ballot and then change your mind or you're worried about not getting the ballot in time and then show up in person, that presents some complexity at the polling place. And there are rules for you need to bring your absentee ballot, make sure it's canceled and then vote in person. And Stacey Abrams claimed is that this this is, you know, the second coming of Jim Crow, how this worked and the training was inadequate. And her group had seven voters they found who were negatively impacted. Six of them voted. There was one poor lady who didn't vote, but she only had a 15 win, 15 minute window to vote, not because anything Georgia did, but because she was living in a senior care facility. And that's the only window that the facility provided for her. But anyway, a- a- Abrams ha- has had to give up her 2018 rhetoric, her claims about the, the system have gotten slammed by a federal judge, and she's very likely to lose on top of it. If Brian Kemp wins, in November, especially if he wins well, it will be satisfying, as you said, for a couple of reasons. One is because Stacey Abrams is terrible. Two, because Brian Kemp is good. Stacey Abrams is proto-Trump in her election denialism. It's easy to forget now because Trump's conduct after the 2020 election was so heinous. But all of the energy around election trutherism 
in 2016, 17, 18, and 19, and even the early part of 2020, when we were told the post office was going to steal the election, came from the Democrats. And the hero of that movement was Stacey Abrams. She can parse her words if she likes, but she refused to concede because she said that the system had been illegitimate. And now this is a liability. So she's backed off from it. And that's a pattern with her. She got out in front of the Major League Baseball boycott in Atlanta. And then when it became clear that this was going to hurt her party and that the voters in Georgia were not buying the narrative, she backed away. She didn't back away her lies about the bill that Georgia passed, but she had that done for her by this federal judge. She is a menace and she should lose. And Brian Kemp should win because mm -hmm. Brian Kemp's a good governor. And not just because he is broadly in line with me on all sorts of issues, although that's why if I were a Georgian, I would vote for him, but because he has assiduously refused to go down the same path that Trump did in Georgia. Georgia's really got it in the neck the last few years. In 2018, the claim was that the election had been stolen for Brian Kemp. In 2020, the claim was that the election had been stolen for Joe Biden. Shortly after 2020, the claim was that the 2022 election was going to be stolen by the Republicans who had rigged it uh, with their supposed voter suppression law. And Brian Kemp and a number of other Republican officials in Georgia have managed to weather that with their integrity intact. Uh, and not just weather it, but in many cases, push back. You know, Brad Raffensperger and Brian Kemp have both said no. And what they have done there, aside from their job, is demonstrate that Republican voters will not immediately drop you if you focus on current issues instead of relitigating the last election at the behest of Donald Trump. And that's a really good thing. And I want to see Brian Kemp win that election because he is in this situation, the good guy. He is the person who did the right thing uh, in all three of the cases I mentioned. You didn't ask me about this, but if I could just say something yeah. very quickly about crime. Of course. I made a joke, you know, all of the crimes happened in in a country that's run by a Democrat. That's how it sounds to me when, say, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says, yes, most of the crime is committed in cities that are run by Democrats, but a lot of it is in states run by Republicans. After a point, that all becomes a little bit irrelevant. You know, the country's run by a Democrat. Does that mean it's Joe Biden's fault? No, it doesn't. Crime is or should be a local question. It should be a question for cities, and to some extent, states. The fact that it is such a big issue in these Senate races is actually not great for our constitutional order. But it is the result of conscious decisions that have been made by the Democratic Party. Now, Republicans have often elevated crime to the federal level as well in ways that I abhor. The drug war, we don't need to go into that. I think it's a disaster. But in the last few years, every issue around crime, including defund the police, including police reform, has been pushed up to the federal level. It's been made into a national issue. And this has been a profound mistake by the Democrats, because as a general rule, they don't win debates about crime. Yes, there are wrinkles here, but Republicans benefit from elections being about crime. It's why Republicans used to win big in Illinois, crime. And what we're now seeing is that play out. 2020 was far less uh, of a windfall for the Democratic Party than it should have been because of their decision to talk about defund the police and nationalize that slogan. Crime is now on the way up. And people are still associating it at the local, state, and national level with democratic policies. And that's beginning to hurt them 
uh, in elections for Washington, D.C. And I think that shows what a mistake it was for them to grab hold of that nettle. If you're a Democrat, you want to do the opposite. You want to say, look, these are local issues. We'll talk about other questions. Washington, D.C. should do different things. But they didn't do that. And they may pay a price for it in a couple of states. Yeah, Charlie, can I just add on on Georgia when we're talking about the kind of job Kemp did? His people will remind you they they reopened before Florida did. And I have a friend who's done some some door to door, goes around the country, follows all these races really closely, and has done some door to door in the North Atlanta suburbs. And he says people remember that and affirmatively bring it up. You know, kept the state open and kept our kids in the schools. So How could you forget the experiment in human sacrifice? <laughs> so he's just a, done a tremendous job all around. MBD is sticking with with Georgia. Story broke last night. I, I I look at this news aggregation site a lot called Memorandum, and two of the top stories were Georgia uh, Herschel Walker paid for an abortion, and Dr. Oz engaged in research that killed puppies. So I was like, okay, it's def- it's definitely October. You know, the, the calendar <laughs> page is has turned. And there's a lot about the story we do not know. It was in the Daily Beast, an anonymous uh, accusation, a, a woman who alleges that Walker paid for her abortion and says that she has the the check and a, a get well card without getting into great detail about this story, which we don't know much about. What are you thinking about Walker? What are you thinking about the the equities that went into to picking Walker and how he's performed overall and what lessons we can draw from it at, at this premature juncture <laughs> well we can't draw lessons from it um because uh, listen if i'm speculating i actually don't think this story is going to hurt him uh as much as people think i think it's like the access hollywood tape where uh people have internalized that um it, there's a prejudice and and it's it's an awful one in in human life but there's a prejudice that successful men, whether it's Donald Trump or Herschel Walker, uh, sometimes have these awful skeletons in their closet and get away with it um, and aren't held accountable for them in any serious way. And uh, I think that's probably going to be the dynamic here, partly because people who are most um, disgusted by abortion uh, it's not intuitive for them to decide to vote for a candidate who believes in federal funding of all abortions. Um, you know, and that's the alternative to Walker uh, in this race. So, no, um, I'm not sure what to make of it. I think it's going to hurt him a little bit, though, um, and partly because as, as we were watching last night, uh, Walker's own son who's kind of a conservative micro celebrity uh, across Instagram and, and other things uh, just decided to go off and denounce his own father uh, as someone who was irresponsible and had too many skeletons in his closet and that his family had begged him to not run. Uh, That could give the story a little bit of, of uh, energy, but uh, in general, I think, you know, he's, he's, polling ahead. He's famous for many other things in the state. Um, he's kind of like a compelling speaker. Uh, and I could just see him weathering the storm. There's also some some questions about the report itself in that uh, there's been this has been rumored to be kind of out there and opposition research has been shopping this for a couple of months now. So you know, how confirmed is it? How uh, unimpeachable is the character witness in the story? We don't know yet. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where I think of it. I don't I don't think it's going to hurt him. Uh, but uh, I mean, I'm not happy. I'm not happy about it. I wouldn't be happy about it if I was a Georgia voter. I feel pretty crappy about voting for Walker. So, Jack, of course, Walker was a Donald Trump production, and one of the themes of this election on the Republican side has been the uh, war between MAGA forces and McConnell forces over nominees and who to back and how. And we had an eruption in this fight 
uh, over the, the weekend or late last week, a absolutely uh, instantly notorious Donald Trump truth social post where he says that McConnell must have a death wish signing off on all this Democratic spending. Is McConnell doing it just out of spite because he hates Donald Trump? That's why he's spending so much money. Not that Donald Trump was, was a great fiscal hawk while he was president and referring to his uh, wife, uh, Elaine Chow, who, of course, served in Trump's cabinet as a, a China loving um uh, a China lover and referring to her by the uh, heinous nickname Coco Chow. So th there are a lot of people who take the death threat element of this seriously. I have wide latitude for that kind of language, but there's no doubt that this this post is just a, another sign that Trump is uh, more out there than ever. I had a prominent Republican tell me, and this this sort of encapsulates the state of the party at the moment. Yeah, you know, uh, Trump's crazier than ever, and that that's why I got got to stay really close to him and and keep keep giving him a lot of a lot of uh, <laughs> advice. Oh uh, yeah, that is that is a nice encapsulation. But yes, this is just the latest sign of of a weird guy. I mean, we we've known this for a while, and. I mean, before this, there were all there was a series of. I don't know what to how to best describe them, but QAnon hinting posts and whether Trump actually believes in the Q conspiracy, I, I don't know. But and what, what his aim in, in making such illusions was, I don't know either, but it's it's weird and it's just a real testament to like what what's the the thing that uh, was often said sort of mockingly by Trump boosters during his presidency was that all that we cared about, that we who were uh, willing to criticize Trump when he was worthy of criticism, also willing to praise him when he was worthy of praise, uh, was, oh, it's the mean tweets you don't like. Well, sure, but like, but the there's more to such things than merely the the weird, now the weird truths. Uh, they're, they're indicative of character. And this is a, this is just a weird guy. I, I don't know what to... What what is the appeal at this point? I mean, the, who is the? I, I was I was looking at this post over the weekend, and I, I was just struggling to see the contact with reality inherent to it. It seems that I I wasn't sure exactly what the spending bills he was talking about were. I wasn't sure if he recalled that he himself had invited Elaine Chow into his cabinet. I, I was just it's just bizarre, but. As for the other the other element of what you were discussing, the the Trump McConnell war in the Senate, this Georgia, since we're talking about Georgia, this is a weird instance of Trump and McConnell actually having reached a kind of truce with Walker. And I think that was mostly because the the other candidates were simply not really in the offing on the Senate side. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was and, a, no, no one no one was gonna beat Walker. Right. The 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 actual, I think he did end up with you know, token opponents, and they, it was just a blowout. I mean, they, as is Walker's want, he he ran right by him <laughs> or ran through him. But no, I think you have a better, even so, you have a better example, I think, in the state right now of political operating in the form of Brian Kemp, who seems to have really done a great, gone a, a long way to resolving the festering sore that has been placed on the Georgia Republican Party since the 2020 election. I mean, you you had Trump trying to uh, have revenge on, on Kemp for doing his constitutional duty. And it just, and Kemp, because the incentives were in place for him to want to keep his job, he just decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to, you want scorched earth? I'll go scorched earth. And there was a great political article that I referred to Constantly, because it was a gr just a fantastic example of how to get what you want in politics, where Kemp just at the at the level of even things such as vendors went totally uh, nuclear on on his uh, Trump backed primary opponent in that race and prevented any that that candidate from getting any footholds. But so that that I think is a much better model. The, the Kemp calm, ruthless competence mm -hmm. versus the Trump world, 
uh, emotionally motivated vengeance quests that end up uh, taking the form of these characters who are defined not as much by their competence, but as by their as by their loyalty to Trump or their ability to possibly help him get what he wants. And I, I think in the places where you've had those candidates there struggling, they're not all going to lose. I mean, so many of them will, will likely win, but it, it's just been uh, a running theme of this primary cycle of blown opportunities for competent individuals to to carry the flag here, but that are instead taken by erratic uh, individuals who are either backed by Trump or who take cues from Trump. Uh, cues, not C-U-E-S, not the letter Q, <laughs> since I have to distinguish here. Uh, yes, yeah, that- so th- obviously the advantage Kemp had that uh, other such Republicans didn't have across the board is an incumbent governor. You know, yes, we had a lot of levers of power and use them very shrewdly. Charlie, when Jack says, you know, I don't know what the point of Trump is at this point. He's obviously singing from your songbook. I mean, this is uh, it's morally reprehensible. It is attacking another Republican viciously, you know, a couple of weeks before a really important election. And it once again demonstrates the attributes of this guy that were repellent to a lot of voters in the suburbs and lost him a winnable race and very well could do the same, certainly would make it much harder than than any other uh, Republican in 2024. His truth. I hate having to say that. <laughs> well, it's appropriate. I mean, because this is what the, the left has done and the, the way they describe things like that for forever. I know, but every time I think of his truth, I think his truth is marching on. And of oh, course, yeah. This, this <laughs> is not the context in which I would place Donald Trump or his activity online. His truth was grotesque. It was ugly, it was dishonest, and it contained a racial slur, whether or not he had that in his heart, I don't know. It's possible that Trump just uses anything he can find to throw at people. Mm-hmm. But that's not what we want. And it's certainly not what we want from somebody who may well run for and become president. My question is, why? Not why does Trump do it? He's never going to stop. He's irredeemable. But why do people put up with it? He is at the moment a private citizen. All he has is his mean tweets. He doesn't have any power. If the Republican primary electorate so chooses, it can keep him from having power again. We're not talking here about somebody who has been chosen as the nominee and is therefore up against the Democrat. It's not a binary choice. We don't have all of the conservative movement's aims glued to Donald Trump. We can pick someone else. Why, seeing who this person is, which I hope we've been able to see for a long time, but if this opened your eyes, welcome. Why would we choose him over someone else? I don't understand. And I don't understand what what Trump said is supposed to accomplish. Let's assume that I am an effete cocktail party, soy boy loser. Let's assume that I care about politeness and niceties. And you don't. But all you care about is winning. Look at politics totally amorally for a second. What did that achieve? He lied about Mitch McConnell. It is not true that Mitch McConnell has been signing off on trillions of dollars of spending. It is not true that Mitch McConnell has ever intimated that he would take positions in which he disbelieves because he hates Trump. In fact, if anything, the opposite's the case. McConnell's kept his mouth shut over and over and over again in order to get things done that he believes in and that he needed Trump to help with. McConnell is within Trump's party. We're just about to come up to an election. Presumably, they have the same interest, which is getting more Republicans elected. We just talked about Herschel Walker. McConnell's been very supportive. Trump knows, or should know, that nothing that happened 
in his presidency would have happened without McConnell. None of the judges, none of the legislation. And then he takes a swipe at a member of his own cabinet who is married to the Senate minority leader, who may well be the Senate majority leader soon. What did that achieve? Again, forget that I don't like it. Forget the accusations of impropriety. Forget the accusations of racism. Forget the criticism of his randomly capitalized letters. What did it achieve? What is he fighting? How did he move the ball? Because from my position here in Florida, I see Donald Trump sitting in Mar-a-Lago tweeting out this crap while my governor is running around the state orchestrating the response to a hurricane, Brian Kemp is up in Georgia delivering the agenda that he promised when he ran in 2018. And all across the country, there are good people uh, who are eligible to run for president in 2024 and who would be infinitely preferable to Donald Trump. And you can't respond to that, as pretty much everyone who wrote to me yesterday after I posted on this did, by saying, so are you saying you would prefer Joe Biden? That's not the question. It is Tuesday, October 4th, 2022. We haven't even had the midterms yet. This is not about Joe Biden. It's about Donald Trump, who is sitting in his house, spewing out garbage. I hope, I hope that people can see the difference between a Trump and a DeSantis, a Trump and a Kemp, a Trump and an Abbott. I hope they can see it because this is indicative of something. It's not mean tweets. That's the symptom, not the disease. This is indicative of something. And that something is that Donald Trump has had his moment, his moment has passed, and it would be an act of grotesque vandalism to put him once again in a position in which he can put himself first savage anyone who disagrees with him and lose his party another election. All right. Exit question to you, MBD. Buckle your seatbelt. It's a triple barreled exit question. First to you, MBD. Who's more likely to win, Oz or Walker? Walker. Jack Butler. Oh, man, this is a hard one. Uh, I guess I would say... Carefully. What was that? He's thinking carefully, <laughs> not going to commit himself rashly. No, no, I never thinking, do such things. Thinking. I would say Walker. Walker. We got two walkers on the board to Charlie Cook. Oz, because mm, in whoa. Pennsylvania, Fetterman is the story in a negative sense. And in Georgia, Walker is the story in a mm. negative sense. So you've been uh, pr pretty consistent that you think Walker's going to win. Now, yes. that, that position would still be consistent with this answer, but do you think still think Walker wins? I don't know. I find it very difficult to predict what's going to happen with this. The reason that I think it might be disastrous is that although I have thought right from the beginning that Walker was going to win, I've never thought he was going to win by much. And mm -hmm. if this does slough off, yeah, you know, the, a small margin, then then he'll lose. I could absolutely see him winning. I think, though, in Pennsylvania, what we are seeing is Oz become the fallback or default or normal candidate, mm -hmm. and Fetterman, right, the risk. Yeah, and, that's a huge. That's a huge switch. Yes, it is. And I think in Georgia, we're not seeing that. And look, uh, Raphael Warnock has many problems, but I think he's played this really well by just saying, I don't want to comment on that. Uh, keep, he, keep he also, I mean, he's, he's too liberal. He's too progressive for Georgia, but he's, he's a winsome guy. He, he, he he's, a, he's a adept performer. I still say Walker. I just think, you know, Kemp, what Kemp could win by six or seven points. And that that's an awful lot of ticket splitting that has to go on. So, and, and Oz obviously has, uh, uh, has transformed that race, but I, I think it's it's still um, really tight. Obviously, they're, they're, we haven't seen any public poll with them ahead. So I'm still going with Walker, MBD. Who's more likely to win, Laxalt or Johnson? Oof. Um, 
Johnson. I think I think the momentum is there. Jack Butler. Easy one, Johnson. You never see him ahead before the election. That he's ahead before the election is just a huge right. sign in his favor. Yeah, might as well be beating by double digits or something. Charlie Cook. Johnson, but for the record, I think both are going to win. Yep, that's the correct answer. Ding, ding, ding. It is Johnson, but both will win. And MBD final one to you. Would you rather be Blake Masters or Tim Ryan? Um, like, the, <laughs> in what context? Uh, <laughs> Good question. Good clarification. Definitely Blake rather Masters be, I mean, has a lot more money, I think. Yeah. So. Blake Masters' wife is super hot. His kids are cool. He has tons of cool guns. <laughs> like, I mean, like, He's friends with Peter Thiel, like close friends. That's not an like, attribute? Not like me, fake friends, but like, yeah, I'd rather be with Masters. He's cool. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, I'd rather be Blake Masters as a human in the race. Uh, unfortunately, Tim Ryan has just had this gusher of money. Um, so... He's in a good position. So, so Tim Ryan? In the context of the election, yeah. But I still think, um, I still think Masters has a shot. I still think the polls are undercounting Republican voters systematically. Jack Butler. I don't think either of these guys wins, but I, I think that Tim Ryan is running a better campaign against JD Vance and. That so I guess in the in political context I'd rather be Tim Ryan and he and I are from the same state I'm not beyond that I don't I don't know enough to say which one of them I'd rather be uh, but I, I find uh, I guess Blake Masters and I have both read the Unabomber's Manifesto so that's uh, that's something but yeah I'd, in political context I'd rather be uh, Tim Ryan Charlie Cook no I'd rather be Blake Masters because I have no doubt whatsoever that J.D. Vance is going to win in Ohio. I think it is unlikely that Blake Masters is going to win in Arizona. But if gas prices were to go to $6, if we have another meltdown in the markets, if we have another terrible jobs report, if it's clear that we're in a recession, then that's the sort of race that could turn on the fundamentals. Yep. It's not going to turn the other way on the fundamentals to benefit Tim Ryan. So I yep. would back Blake Masters, if I were betting. Yep, that's why I, that's why I think it's better to be Blake Masters. I do think there's a problem with the the polling in Ohio, oversampling college educated voters who. Are, yeah, I I think you're to, right about that. I, I don't you know, think it's as quite as close as the polls are suggesting. Yeah, and, and per Charlie's point, there's a chance there's some form of red wave that could bring Masters over the top. Although he is a, a desperately flawed candidate, and McConnell people don't like him, and kind of. Uh, want Peter Thiel to assume all responsibility for for this guy, kind well, of being indicated so. that he foisted uh, Thiel two of them gonna... on him, Masters and, and JD. And JD will win, but Republicans have had to spend a lot of money in that state. So anyway, I'd rather be Masters. Sorry, MBD, what was that? I think Thiel is going to pony up more money in Arizona. I think the, the indicator is that he's done spending in Ohio, but he's now going to invest big time in getting uh, Masters over the line. All right, so let's hear from our second sponsor of this episode, Tommy John. Fall is chaos in your pants. You're overheating one second and freezing the next. To be ready for anything, you need underwear that can handle everything. It's time for Tommy John underwear. And Tommy John underwear, you're that much more comfortable, so you can do everything better. Name a problem with other underwear, and Tommy John solved it. Tommy John's breathable, lightweight fabric has four times the stretch of competing brands. They come with a no edgy guarantee thanks to a non-rolling waistband and legs that never ride up. Plus, they feature a horizontal quick draw fly. Hammock patch support stops any awkwardness, giving everyone something to be grateful for. With over 17 million pairs sold, people love Tommy John underwear. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. It has Fanatics. Plus, everything's backed with Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free. Guarantee. Go to TommyJohn.com slash editors right now for 20% off your first order. 20% off at TommyJohn.com slash editors. TommyJohn.com slash editors. Please see the site for details. Check it out, everyone. So, Jack Butler, we have the news. 
that Peter Daszak, who heads this uh, um, outfit with a sinister anodyne name, EcoHealth Alliance. You, you either know with a name like that, it's a, it's a wonderful organization, totally uh, devoted to the health of our planet, or is is t- totally sinister and underhanded, and it's it's kind of been uh, tilting towards the latter during the the pandemic. They uh, of course got funding that was funneled to the Wuhan lab. Probably never know, you know, what role that played, or or whether there was a lab leak that started the pandemic. But just putting that aside, even if. EcoHealth Alliance's funding had nothing to do with anything that happened with the pandemic. Dazic still played this this really unworthy role in the saga, trying to cover up uh, the funding, try to to, uh, steer everyone away from the possibility of a lab leak and to say it was naturally caused by the the wet market or or some other um, naturally occurring uh, uh, phenomenon. And now we learn, Jack Butler, that Eco Health Alliance is getting yet more funding before we've gotten to the bottom of what happened with the the, the first uh, funding or the controversial funding, or uh, had any accountability for the way he conducted himself uh, during the debate over this. Yeah, so I have the grant application right here. Uh, if you will excuse this indulgence, immediately a place before his eyes appeared. Sad, noisome, dark, a Lazar house it seemed, wherein were laid numbers of all diseased, all maladies of ghastly spasm or wrecking torture, qualms of heartsick agony, <laughs> all feverous kinds, convulsions, epilepsies, fierce catters, intestine stone ulcer, colic pangs, demoniac frenzy, moping melancholy, and moonstruck madness, pining atrophy. Merasmus and wide wasting pestilence, dropsies, asthmas, and joint ranking thumes. So sorry, that's not the grant. That's a quote <laughs> from Paradise Lost, where the angel, the archangel Michael, is showing Adam, "Hey, if you guys uh, decide to sin, this is the some some of the things that death will have access to. So don't sin." But we did sin, uh, sadly, and. What we have now is, so here's the best case for the kind of research that Dazic is doing. And this is the, the, the scientific world's case that to prevent or prepare ourselves for future pandemics, we basically need to engineer them in safe conditions and so that we know how to fight them if they show up. So I guess you can see that being somewhat rational, except... There's a giant possibility, it seems to me the likeliest possibility, that this is exactly how we got COVID. And so if we have this as the test case, this it seems to me that you don't want to keep doing this stuff. And yet we are. And we have this, so we have evidence that this is going to, ha- this kind of research is going to happen again. I, I just, it is ridiculous. I, I, I can't believe that it's, that we have this news development. I can't believe that the scientific medical health establishment is willing to do this kind of thing again. Uh, I, I can't believe it's the same guy. <laughs> like, uh, it's just ridiculous. It, it gets me really worked up, not, and not just because uh, Jim Garrity is absent. This is something I am objectively concerned about. Uh, and it is really like, it, it goes down to the uh, Jurassic Park thing about your scientists, uh, we're so concerned about asking if they are figuring out if they could, they didn't ask if they should. I think that if there's even look, even if this is not how COVID came into the world, this I, I, I don't think people really knew that this sort of research was happening before, or certainly it was not widely known. And now that the details have been laid out, I think the case for it has severely diminished. Uh, there have to be other ways of doing the necessary research for uh, for keeping ourselves safe from pandemics that don't involve creating pandemics. There's got to be something better we can do, and that this is being considered still is just the the worst kind of depression-inducing insanity because it suggests that no one has learned anything about anything that has happened over the past three years of civilization-altering <laughs> pandemics. And that uh, the the miasmas and and uh, epilepsies and and whatnot that the archangel Michael showed to Adam uh, are still out there waiting, and maybe this time 
to, to quote another part from Paradise Lost, there will be some infernal engines divi- um, added to them and they'll be made even worse. So I'm really worked up about this and right, it should well be done. done. Well, well done, Jack. So <laughs> Charlie, there's a piece at, at Unheard about this and it made the argument that I uh, think seems pretty, pretty compelling to me. Say there'd been some terrible nuclear disaster that killed a couple million of people. Everyone who had anything to do with that uh, reactor or arguably anything to do with that phenomenon would have been shut down immediately. You know, the massive investigations, nothing would move or, or happen till we got to the bottom of it. And for some reason, this is that rule doesn't apply <laughs> to the pandemic. And not just that installation and not just those scientists and not just anyone who was connected to that facility, but every nuclear power station we would be in the midst of a huge global protest against nuclear power if that had been the cause if an american nuclear weapon in storage somewhere had detonated we would see a resurgence in the appeal of cnd yeah i mean we we just have a you know a close a theoretical close call and you have germany shutting down its whole nuclear industry yes well this is of course source of great irritation to me is the frequency with which anti-nuclear activists point to Three Mile Island as if it was a disaster rather than a success story, rather than a, an example of the system working as it should. But that's not our topic. People do not want to acknowledge this. I think we talked to Jim recently about this. He's not going to get his Pulitzer. I mean, he wasn't going to get a Pulitzer anyway, because he writes for National Review. But he's not going to get his moment. It is not going to be acknowledged. It's difficult quite to explain why, except that I think there's almost no pre-existing infrastructure that is set up to agitate in this area. It's not assumed by the people who think they're on the side of truthness, uh, truthness, truth and light. That's what to... they, that's what they do consider it. Yeah. <laughs> Truth- <laughs> wasn't truthiness. Wasn't that's that right. the John Stewart thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's not considered by those people, um, as a, a bad with the capital B industry as a risky proposition. Whereas, say, nuclear power is, nuclear weapons are, um, you know, DDT was. But it's quite, it's quite difficult, actually, to, to work out why that is, especially now. Why aren't we seeing a, a pushback? And I, I wonder whether it's because, and I understand these things aren't identical, but I wonder whether it's because in people's imaginations, sort of investigation into viruses and medical innovation are inextricably linked. And as a result, the same place that potentially caused this pandemic is the place that gave us the vaccine. Whereas that's just not the case when you have, say, a nuclear accident. Uh, you know, the the nuclear power station doesn't clean itself up, doesn't produce the firefighters out of its chimney. So, I I mean, I I don't quite know why it is, but I I completely agree with the, the unheard thesis, which is that it is odd that we just went through this international crisis that killed huge numbers of people and cost trillions of dollars and haven't changed much uh, about our behavior. So MBD, feel free to bounce off any of that. Also, we had news last several days of the level of compensation that Fauci has has achieved. And it's extraordinary. I mean, he makes a, a huge salary. We knew that. Uh, his wife also has a huge government sal- salary, I believe, works at the NIAD as well. And then you had, weirdly, I assume it's legal. You know, he wouldn't be taking this money, but still just seems very odd. He, he 
all, all these nonprofits had thrown money at him. Some nonprofit gave him close to a million dollar uh, award for supposedly speaking truth to power during the, the pandemic. So anyone who's worried that Fauci is going to have any trouble in his retirement uh, does, does, not, uh, does not need to lose sleep over it. Yeah, I mean, this is... Um, uh, I, I'm not as mystified, I think, as Charlie is by it. Uh, he's right that partly it's the fact that, you know, this is public health is both Baptist and bootlegger in this uh, drama. Uh, the worldview of public health people is that the great masses of people, democracy, is composed of uh, idiots who, you know, wanted to torture Galileo and Darwin and, um, you know, strangle Louis Pasteur or whatever, um, that we're all wicked and we ha and the truth has to be hidden from us. That's why the World Health Organization also, you know, uh, its initial response to the Wuhan virus was to begin um, preemptively excusing the Chinese government, right? Um, so it makes perfect sense that Peter Daszak would get these grants again to literally to <laughs> infect human cells with novel bat coronaviruses in Vietnam. Uh, <laughs> Because if he wasn't getting the grants, it would be an admission that he did something wrong. Now, we all know he did something wrong because we all know, having read the subsequent journalism, that the letter he organized uh, to the Lancet to squash the lab leak theory was unethical, that he didn't disclose his own interests in it, that it wasn't even really scientific in any, any strictly sense. It wasn't a scientific case. It was just a kind of miasma of excuses. Um, I, I think, and I said at the beginning of this pandemic that it would be hard, if the lab leak is true, it will be hard for people to accept. It is very difficult for people to accept the idea that um, a tragedy on that scale could be authored by, you know, two score humans making decisions over the course of a few years and mistakes. I think it's very hard for people to accept that because there's no, it, it, the enormity of it is so great that the idea of inflicting justice upon uh, the people who made these mistakes becomes impossible. Uh, you know, cause they were mistakes, right? They were, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't intentional either. Right. They had good intentions. So I, I just think this is like a, a mystery that will never be solved. I mean, my mood is, is much more of like, uh, you know, when in the course of human events, it becomes <laughs> necessary for one people to drown scientists in hydrofluoric acid. Um, <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, when you, when you said it wasn't possible to uh, imagine a punishment worthy of the crime, I was like, no, I think MBD is thinking of something. Well, <laughs> no, but uh, that, that's the mood Dante's I'm in. Inferno. <laughs> that's, that's the mood I'm in. But it, no, this is a this is a this is a massive, um, this is a massive problem, right? Like, who do you, um, how how do you assign responsibility for even, uh the kind of collective panic towards masks that has now led to like worldwide problems of speech development in children, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, you know, there were all good intentions along the way, but uh, there were also people who should have known better that should have sounded the alarm or should have uh, explained the science more um, forthrightly. But they all got caught up in they all got caught up in protecting the reputation of science itself. I mean, I think because Capital they literally, S. They literally yeah, science as an Science's enterprise. Scientism. Yeah. They you know, they are afraid that if it got out that this was the lab leak, if it got out that this was all back to Peter Daszak's original uh gain of function uh grant seeking and the way he kind of routed around us bans on this kind of research that we would zero the budget of, uh, public scientific research in the country, right. Which would collapse 
every university department doing valuable research as well with it. Uh, I don't think that would actually be the reaction, you know, as angry as I am about the last three years, but they do. So, um, so to, this, to, this kind of conspiracy, this guild conspiracy will continue for as long as we live. Jack Butler, segue to exit question to you. When and if Republicans take the House, they'll conduct an investigation of the origins of the pandemic and public health funding that will materially move the ball in terms of our understanding of both. Yes or no? They'll conduct an investigation, but I'm concerned that there's been too much uh, good covering of tracks here. And I mean, especially because one of the implicated actors is the Chinese government, which has long ago destroyed any evidence that could possibly lead to the tr- to the full and complete truth. So that's my answer. Charlie Cook. I'm a little skeptical that this will ever come out. I don't mean to sound conspiratorial, but the pushback against the idea that this could have been man-made was so profound that digging into the details seems less likely to me. Uh, Republicans will get distracted by like scoring the cheapest, easiest points against Fauci uh, along the way. They won't, they won't dig deep to the real issue. I think there'll there'll be a serious investigation, and we'll we'll learn more. I don't think we're getting to the bottom of anything, but I do think we'll learn more. So I'm a yes with that. Let's hear from our third sponsor this episode, Masterworks. Inflation is a disaster for this country, and who's paying the price? Americans just trying to invest and grow what they have, but not everyone is sitting idly by. And you can always learn from the greats. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, right now, they're prepping for what's coming because a recent McKinsey study just broke some pretty remarkable news. These major institutions have been quietly reallocating 30 to 50% of their portfolios into alternative assets, alternative assets like contemporary art. Why? They know that the last time inflation was this high, contemporary art appreciated an average of 33% per year, according to the MW All Art Index. That's higher than real estate and gold. That's part of the reason why Masterworks is flooded with demand right now. They buy the same contemporary art from legends like Picasso and Banksy and break it into shares so you can invest for a fraction of the cost. So far, they've sold six paintings for an average net return of 29%. Obviously, demand for Masterworks is surging. So there's a wait list, but you can skip it by using their special code to join. Simply go to masterworks.io slash editors. Again, that's masterworks.io slash editors. See important regulation A disclosures at masterworks.io slash CD. Again, masterworks.io slash editors. Please check it out. So Charlie Cook... We have a new law in California passed last week, signed by Gavin Newsom, creating a transgender sanctuary in California. If you are having trouble as a transgender youth getting, quote, unquote, gender affirming care in one of the red states out there, Texas or Alabama or wherever you can come, to California and not worry. You'll get the quote unquote care you deserve. What do you make of it? I think this is a fairly straightforward on the merits question. California can do this, but shouldn't. The policy itself is evil. I really struggle to believe that it is popular in California. I suppose we will see, but I anticipate something of a backlash, even there. I think that it is an example of the perils of one party rule, where you have a an electorate that habitually votes for one party and prefers that party on balance to the other one, but doesn't necessarily like all of its ideological extremes. The policy itself is misguided, and that's a light way of putting it, because it assumes that children can and should make these sorts of decisions without their parents. I'll leave aside what you think of the trans question. 
leave aside the many examples of regret, sometimes suicidal regret, that are beginning to trickle out. This is an inversion of not just the role of parents, but of the role of anyone else who is expected to act in loco parentis. The procedures that California is fostering and offering and divorcing in the permission structure from parents are mostly irreversible. We do not like, as a culture, to give irreversible decision-making power to minors because we don't believe, correctly, I think, that they're capable of exercising that. This question gets much more difficult when we're talking about adults. I'm still greatly skeptical. But the mechanisms by which we might uh, enforce our preferences on adults are different. But children, the, the debate was summed up, I think, quite well in a recent piece in, I believe, Vox, which said, instead of asking what could go wrong if we allow children to transition, which is a euphemism, ask what could go wrong if we don't. And I think dispositionally, that almost perfectly sums up the difference between the progressive approach to politics and life and the conservative approach to politics and life. But in this case, it is profoundly mistaken because we're not talking here about some mere social experiment. We're talking about physical actions. We're talking about permanent alterations, the uh, cutting off of breasts, uh, the introduction into female bodies of testosterone, uh, the swapping or creation of a sat's genitalia. It, it is, I think, in the first place, unclear to me why California and indeed progressivism in general is so obsessed with this, but to have uh, codified it into law in this manner is an escalation and um, I think one that will backfire on its advocates on Gavin Newsom who touted the bill uh, and on the Democratic Party including in California MBD don't hold that <laughs> um, listen California is violating uh, you know, Charles may be right that legally they are within their their rights to impose or put up this law, but it is contrary to the primal law and and one recognized by the Supreme Court that parents have the primary care for their children. Um, and what what bothers me about this move is that it seems like Gavin Newsom is responding to the news cycle, that he sees conservatives are making political hay out of transgender madness, particularly on children. And that literally he almost like feels provoked in a dialectical spirit and says, okay, well, if they're against it, it must be really right. And I must really go all the way in endorsing the idea that children uh, should um, be able to receive these upon entering California, even against the permission of their parents. Um, and um, I don't know. I feel I am, I feel sad for, for California and for my country that this is the state we're in. Um, but, but there it is. I mean, he's provoked to do something even more wicked and evil. Um, and I'm just waiting for the day when the lawsuits finally come. I mean, as, as we've predicted on this show and in, uh, on national review online before, uh, that surely children who have this done to them are going to wake up and realize many of them are, we're seeing this on detransition message boards and 
uh, documentaries all the time now. They're going to wake up and realize my <laughs> sexuality has been stolen from me. I've, I'm condemned to a lifetime of um, sexual dysfunction or even uh, difficulty urinating if I've had surgery. Um, and a lifetime of further surgeries to prevent mm -hmm. uh, it, deadly infection. So that we're all doing this because, you know, in the 19, early 1980s, Judith Butler inflicted this word game on her university students about gender and sex uh, is a testimony to the power of demons. Mm. So, Jack, Jack, are you going to read from Paradise Lost again? <laughs> oh, I would just like to point out that uh, I have no. I think Sarah has her title part. for the for this episode. Um, so, so Jack, let's move a little bit off the transgender and talk uh, about Gavin Newsom. This is of a piece with recent efforts to elevate himself as a foil for the perfidy supposedly taking place in red states and to hold up California as a model of progressive governance across the board, whether it's just the measure we're discussing or, of course, climate change and uh, other things. Yeah. So the problem posed by California in our national politics is not an unprecedented one in this sense, which is that we have had large states in our nation's history that have sort of punched above their weight and have thrown themselves around and been able to influence the behavior of other states. The difference with California these days is that the ends to which it is using this ability, this, this outsized uh, influence it is able to wield in our politics is toward these extremely progressive ends. I mean, the, the transgender stuff is, a, is the most heartbreaking example in the case of the, the people who are uh, affli afflicted and affected by this experimentation. But the you also have, as you mentioned, the climate change. Uh, the, the, there was just a battle in Virginia that uh, Governor Youngkin led to basically detach uh, Virginia's emissions regime from California's, which was done via uh, policy in the North administration. So what California does is provide this kind of this beacon to other states as a model for what uh, progressivism can be. And if you look, if you look at California, uh, there was a great piece that we published by Will Swaim of the California Policy Institute that uh, was titled "California Uberales," quoting the Dead Candy song about Zen fascists controlling you and you and people being made to be mellow. And that that's really that's basically what's happening. And, and Newsom is has kicked this up to uh, another level, be both because, I don't know, he probably at this point genuinely believes it, but more important, he thinks that he can use it in service of his ambitions. And so I think there has been a challenge. Do you, I can't remember who began this challenge. I think it was DeSantis who wanted to challenge New. Was it, do you, who, who began this debate? Was it Newsom who challenged DeSantis? It was DeSantis? Newsom, yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is what Newsom is trying to do as create himself as this as this foil for the for the people for efforts on the right. I mean, he's also paying for billboards in other states uh, saying, come get uh, an abortion here. And then he uh, egregiously demonically quotes a scripture to this end, which is uh, since, since we're all about demons on this episode, I just <laughs> let's point that out. But yeah, I think the so it's disgusting in itself, but also it, it serves as ambitions because I think there is some plausibility to something we discussed uh, earlier, maybe over the summer, about how Newsom is not going to, you know, try to uh, like he's he's not going to primary a, a Joe Biden if there's a Joe Biden uh, presidential run in 2020, uh, 2024. But he's gonna he's he's putting himself out there as a as a possibility in case you know something might happen to Joe Biden. Who knows? But uh, that's, uh, that's a segue to the next question to Charlie Cook. Who would you rather be, Gavin Newsom or Kamala Harris? Kamala Harris. MBD. Uh, Gavin Newsom. Jack Butler. I think Newsom. So I'm going to make it a tie. I say Kamala Harris because there is some potential she is going to become president of the United States over the next two years without lifting a finger. And then she'd obviously be the nominee in 2024 if it's uh, 
even if it's a flat out just a primary, uh, it's a it's a close call. Then I might be Newsom because I just think Harris is so so bad at this. So we didn't get a chance to get to it because it was kind of fell awkwardly between it uh, episodes. But the the statement she made about equity and hurricane relief really we need DEI, you know, in hurricane relief. And how, how could any functional politician, anyone who's not you know employed by Oberlin College? say such a thing, think such a thing. It's really extraordinary. Uh, anyway, I would be, rather be her, all that All that said. So let me do a quick NR plus plug, digital subscription service at nashreview.com. We have a subscription drive running as we speak to urge all of you to sign up. If you haven't already, it is your way to get around our increasingly extensive metered paywall your way if you sign up and log in to see 90% fewer ads, especially no more pop-ups that might be the most uh, annoying of our advertising. Your way to dig deeper into our community. You can comment on articles and blog posts. You can be part of our private Facebook group. You get invitations to exclusive calls and events with our editors, writers, and other conservative figures. We had a great <clears throat> meetup out in LA in Marina Del Rey, just uh, Friday here, last Friday at a humble watering hole called Killer Shrimp. And just great. I mean, and our readers are the absolute best <laughs> diverse interest and backgrounds and really knowledgeable and totally devoted to the the cause. So it was great to spend time with folks out there. We have some more of these coming up. If they're coming to your area, we'll be sure to send an invite to your inbox. So anyway, all this is to say, please, 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 if you haven't already, sign up for NR+. Plus. Now let's hit a few other things before we go. MBD, you are listening to a composer called Antonio Lotti. Yeah, Lotti uh, is most famous for his setting of the Crucifixus. Uh, just a line of the creed for eight voices. And um, I don't, you know, to describe like what liturgical music, what, what sacred music is to others is kind of difficult. Um, but I would say um, if you're familiar with Christ's transfiguration on the mountain, that he kind of is seen in his spiritual reality as shining with glorious light among a symbol of the prophets and, the law, uh, liturgical music is your prayer, uh, as maybe as God sees it, right? Like when, when these composers are putting these lines into these musical settings, uh, you know, the little prayer you, you humbly squeak out in the silence of your heart is actually there, uh, transfigured into this high culture and music and, uh, yeah, it's very moving. I think when you mm. when you consider that and uh, just the the passion behind even just this one line of the creed, he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. Um, uh, to turn that into the uh, this transfigured cry of the human heart, I think uh, is astounding. It's, it's what I've been reflecting on this week as I've been getting melodramatic about. <laughs> foreign events. All right. So Jack, uh, over to you to follow up with that. There's something with <laughs> equally profound and of equal spiritual import. That's right. It's something totally transcendent. <laughs> Chicken noodle soup. <laughs> and here's why. The So I was walking around the grocery store uh, after it's the other day, and th this came just as fall temperatures somewhat suddenly uh, came to the Washington, D.C. area. And I just got a real hankering for soup. And so I so I got the, the fixings and I, I made it. And just after I made the pot of chicken noodle soup, I, I got a message from our Buckley feller, Luther Abel, <laughs> in which he, he sent a, a tweet from this very funny account. He's from Wisconsin. I'm from Ohio. Uh, so it's Midwest versus everybody. And it, this is an account or the, the tweet reads drops 20 degrees. And now every Midwesterner is having soup for dinner. <laughs> and I was just like, wait a minute. What, why, why did I do this? I, I guess there was just something in my nature that made me want chicken noodle soup when it got slightly cooler outside, so, um, but I enjoyed it. It's great. And yeah. now I have a bunch of it 
I'm all in favor of chicken noodle soup. Freshly made chicken noodle soup is is awesome. Charlie, you finally saw a Top Gun Maverick. Yeah, speaking of great spiritual importance, I <laughs> finally saw. Wait, wait, wait! Is that your your way of hinting at the esoteric view of the movie? I didn't know the esoteric view of the movie, Jack. But uh, given that you and I are friends, that's probably my flaw. I should have asked you, as with everything, what is the esoteric view of the movie? Well, it's that Maverick dies in the opening scene, and the the rest of it is some sort of purgatorial experience. Hmm. I I think this is nonsense, but there are people who believe this. Okay, that's interesting. Well, I uh, am not among them, but I did enjoy the movie a great deal. I think it's one of the best movies I've seen for quite a while. It was exciting from start to finish. Uh, It's a much, much better movie than the original Top Gun, which I liked a great deal. But as a movie, it's much better put together. Uh, The acting is pretty great. I think there's a case for... Tom Cruise is the greatest movie star of all time. As someone pointed out to me recently, he, he has had a career for nearly 40 years. It's like, you know, if Jimmy Stewart had had a 40-year career mm-hmm. at the top of his game. Yeah. Ever since it's, I was born. Like the Tom Brady of movie stars. Yeah. And I think they're friends, actually. Maybe they drink from the same fountain of youth. But no, this is a really good movie. I, I was late to it. I'm late to everything. I'm, I'm useless with movies. And so I'd heard hype after hype after hype. And every single person I met said, this is such a good movie. And Sarah Shetty's seen it 286,000 times. Uh, but uh, no, it lives up to the hype. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a blockbuster, but a good one. So I've been following every Aaron Judge at bat, of course, as he's gotten to 60 and then 61. And it's an incredible achievement, but uh, it, and this isn't a worthy sentiment, but it's gotten so frustrating. I mean, my, my whole life centers around it. I got to stop everything. And my wife's like, now what, you know, and, and, uh, uh, 61, of course I missed, I, I at least, you know, there are no other options if I'm not near a TV or, or a radio, I'll watch on the ESPN app on my phone. And uh, I was in a uh, NR board meeting and I'd been tracking pretty closely despite the, the board meeting judges at bats. And I knew in the back of my head, you know, he's coming around, he's coming around again. And then someone was giving concluding remarks at this board meeting. I was like, you know what? I, I, it's a little rude. I'm just gonna be really polite and 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 not look at my phone during these remarks. And of course, that's <laughs> that's when he hit 61. I'm, but it's there have been a lot of walks there now. The strikeouts are being beginning to pile up. He has three games left as we speak. They have a doubleheader uh, today in Texas. I still think he's doing it, and in fact, I think he's getting to 63. I just sort of go on the Roger Maris model that the pressure gets to you, and, and then but but there's a break at the end. So I'm still counting on that. I shouldn't complain. It's been it's been wonderful to uh, to 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 live through but a, a little in, inconvenient. So with I read that, the other day, Rich, that by the end, Roger Harris, uh, Harris, Maris's hair was falling out. Yeah. That's how yeah. stressed he was about making it. Yeah, and Barry Bonds, of all people, you know, said when uh, Judge got to 60, 61 is going to be the hard one. Not that Bonds would really know, but because uh, uh, he blew through it with artificial enhancements. But, you know, that ended up being right. And you'd see... Um, judge who shows no emotion on the field as a general matter, except for you know, the end of the game, um, you know, this kind of DiMaggio, DiMaggio-esque affect, uh, you know, wanting to grind his bat to sawdust after just flying out, which you never saw the rest of the season. And just, you know, the, the, the visible relief and joy when he hit 61. So I'm hoping we see that again with uh, 62 or 63. So it's that time in the podcast for our editor's picks. MBD, what's your pick? Uh, my pick is from uh, another pick from a recent issue of National Review. It's Rick Brookheiser's little column, Avenue of Broken Dreams, about crime in New York City near his apartment. And um, I love what Rick does, uh, especially when he's being compact and suggestive. And he's right about his call to the mayor that Mayor Adams needs to address this or he has failed. Jack Bala, what's your pick? So I have a double pick because the one author wrote two pieces last week for us. It was Charles Hailu, a National Review summer intern. He started off the week with uh, the DEI bureaucracy is failing even on its own terms, pointing out that the University of Michigan, which has a massive and expansive uh, DEI bureaucracy, is actually not improving 
uh, student comedy. It's co comedy, rather. It's making it worse. And then on Sunday, uh, free markets flourish at the Reagan Ranch, a wonderful dispatch from the Reagan Ranch, in, at which Charles was able to learn about uh, the glories of Reagan and Reaganism. So two good pieces by former National Review. So, so Jack, by the way, I meant to praise you, but I forgot yesterday we had that great piece by the Marines. Yes. Uh, and all these Medal of Honor winners about how the Marine Corps is losing, losing its way. That was extraordinarily good and important. Th those were but, some really impressive authors. Yeah. Yeah, if you look really at their Medal of Honor citations. Yeah, just humbling to read the bio line on that that piece. Charlie Cook. Yeah. Jack, I've also forgotten to praise you for about five years. <laughs> um, <laughs> keep it up. Mine is a corner post by Jim Garrity. What if the unthinkable isn't quite so unthinkable anymore? And it's about the prospect of the detonation of a nuclear weapon by Russia. Jim runs through. Some of the alarming signs, and in a, is it in a sense responding, uh, although not directly, to something I said on the editors last week, which is that I just don't have the moral imagination to imagine what would you know, result if this this fateful decision were made. But I particularly like this post, not just because it was comprehensive, but because in the course of making his case that crazy things can happen, uh, Jim says. In January 2020, some people noticed this strange new virus in Wuhan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that really made me stop in my tracks. Yeah, it was unthinkable that we would have another Spanish flu for 100 years, and then we did. We haven't seen the detonation of a nuclear weapon in anger since 1945, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. Yeah, I remember Tom Cotton coming out of the first impeachment uh, proceedings talking about this this virus. And I, I kind of discounted the worst case because usually the worst case doesn't happen, but, but it did on a similar theme, exactly similar theme. My pick is MVD's piece today, our nuclear options. Also thinking through the unthinkable. I am not uh, entirely with, with M MBD on, uh, on the war, but I, I was also uh, my ears perked up and MBD addresses this when David Petraeus was on, I believe it was this week, this past Sunday, and he was asked, what would we do if Russia detonated a tactical nuke? And he's basically all out war between NATO and Russia. We'd go in and destroy everything that that Russia has, you know, in, in the Black Sea and in Ukraine. And I mean, that's just a, a recipe for a major escalation you know a, uh, a, a, a he says it wouldn't expand from there <laughs> yeah right but why if if putin obviously is desperate enough to use a tactical nuke why wouldn't he do the uh, why wouldn't he take the next step you know in response to that so it's, that's not a good answer i'm not saying i have a great answer um and you know we have to sort of hope and pray obviously this doesn't happen but there's some potential that Russia gets kind of swept from the table uh, in the south and the east in Ukraine after having doubled down with this supposed annexation. And what does Putin do then? I mean, it's a very it's a very dangerous time. And a point I very much take from MBD's piece is that we're kind of thinking about this war as kind of proxy wars that we have uh, fought, you know, over the last 20 years and not Libya or something. But the the big difference is you got a guy uh, sitting on a lot of nuclear weapons and uh, uh, really might be backed into a corner where he think his, thinks his regime is at risk. So this is this is a dangerous moment and to be continued. So that's it. We'll for, meet again. Uh, yes. You've been listening to a National Review podcast and rebroadcast, retransmission, or count this game without the express written permission of National Review Magazine is strictly prohibited. This podcast has been produced by the incomparable Sarah Shitty, who makes us sound better than we deserve. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, MBD. Thank you, Jackie B. Thanks to NetChoice, Tommy John, and Masterworks. And thanks especially to all of you for listening. We're the editors. We'll see you next time.